In this video, we're going to have a look at another method for deriving the Riemann curvature tensor using parallel transport of a vector around a closed path on some given manifold. So here's our manifold, and we're going to start with a vector at the point A, and then we're going to parallel transport it from A to B to C, and then we're going to take the vector and parallel transport it from A to D to C along these paths. So this is the x1 direction, the x2 direction. All right, so there's our two paths, and we'll parallel transport a vector from A to B to C, and then from A to D to C, and we'll compare the changes in the vector when it gets to point C, because they won't be the same. Being a curved space, there, there will be a change as a parallel transport around two different paths. In flat space, that won't happen the net change in flat space would be zero, but in curved space it's not. So we're going to have some vector v, and we're going to parallel transport along two different paths. The paths will be along the coordinate lines x1 equals a, to x1 equals a plus delta a, x2 is b, and x2 is b plus delta b. So they're the two paths. Um, now delta a will be incredibly small, so it's a very small region on the manifold we're looking at, infinitesimally small, so it's a very small loop, and we're going to parallel transport this vector around this very, very small loop, but in two opposite directions around the loop, and just see what the change is at point C. So the condition for parallel transport of a vector is, here's the covariant derivative of the vector, expressed here, and the condition will be that the covariant derivative is zero. So the covariant derivative of the vector when it's parallel transport is zero. So when it's applied in the x1 direction of our manifold, the condition in component form is this object here, dx1, and the vector v alpha, the components change in the x1 direction, plus the change in the basis vectors, that's where this business over here is. So that e set that equal to zero, and we'll find that dv alpha dx1 is minus the vector components times the change in the basis vectors. So path 1, A, B, and then up to C. Okay, so X1 will go from A to X1 is A plus delta A. Remember, delta A is going to be infinitesimally small. It's a very small loop. So we've got our vector V. Here it is, the orange one. It's defined at A, and we then parallel transport it to B. Now, it's a very small distance that's been trans uh, parallel transported over. So here's the condition again. Now, this... Uh, Vector addition is not defined, this vector subtraction is not defined on a manifold because it's at two different points. But for an infinitesimally small loop, it's a reasonable approximation. So the vector at B minus the vector at A right, is approximately equal to this integral here. Okay? And we can do that for an infinitesimally small loop, it's a very good approximation. Okay. And then we replace the VR for the X1 with V mu times the change in the basis vectors, this gamma business here. Okay, when we do that, we have this expression in the change of the vector and going from A to B. Next step is from B up to C. And here the condition is change in the is dV alpha the X2 because we're now moving in the X2 direction is minus v uh, mu times the change in the basis vectors here. All right, when we integrate from b to c, we get the change in the vector at c minus the change, uh, the value of the vector at c minus the value of the vector at b. And for a very small distance, this is a reasonably good approximation, is equal to this integral over here. Right. So the net change for path one and going from A to B to C is V of C minus V of A is the change in going from A to B plus the change in going from B to C. And that's this object here. Alright, path two now is going from A to D to C. Alright, so when we integrate from A to D, we get this object here. Alright, next step. When we integrate from D to C along here, we get this object here. Yeah. 
next is now the net change for path 2 from A to D to C is V of C minus V of A is the change in going from A to D plus the change in going from D to C. So that gives us this object here. Right, the net change in the vector is found by summing the changes due to each portion of the path. So when we arrive at the point C, what is the change in the vector in going via path 2? And we subtract from that the change in going via path 1. Right? Now in flat space this will be 0 because the change in the, the vector of C will be the same whichever path you take. But in curved space it's not. And it's because these basis vectors differ from point to point on the manifold. So we have this expression here, and we just step back a bit and remind ourselves, let's put the dx2s together, for instance, that one and that one, and the dx1s together, that one and that one. So we have dx1, dx1, then dx2, dx2, and just remind ourselves which was which. So this was path A to D, this bit, this was path B to C, D to C, A to B. All right, now along A to D, all right, integrating along the x2 direction, just as we are with bc along the dx2 direction. Now a to d was the left-hand part of our loop, b to c was the right-hand part of our loop. Now we'd like to compare these two areas because they're both integrating across dx2. But you can't compare vectors on different points on the manifold. So what we might do is the vector changes along the path a to d. We might approximate those moving over in the dx1 direction over to the right hand side we'll approximate in terms of the path along b to c so how does this the vector as it was parallel transported along a to d the left hand part of the loop can we approximate it in terms of the changes if we moved it over to the right in the dx1 direction shifted it right what would it look like over there if we could approximate along the path b to c because then we could compare the changes here and with the changes along here. Okay. Likewise in the path from D to C and uh, A to B, uh, A to B was the bottom part of the loop and D to C was the top part of the loop, so AB and DC. Again along AB the bottom path, if we could just move it up in the DX2 direction and approximate it along the D to C path, we would get this Taylor series expansion along here. All right. When we do that, notice here in the A to D and B C path, this first term here is a minus, and this is a plus, and they will disappear, and we'll be left with just this part of the Taylor series expansion, this part here in the dx2 direction. So here it is. And for the DC and AB paths, this term here plus the integral of this term will cancel out with minus the integral of that term, because they're both the same both along dx1, and we're left with just the Taylor series expansion part, and here it is. Alright, good old Taylor series. Alright, so um, just to remind you again, A to B to C, how did the vector change? And then A to D to C, how did the vector change? Alright, so delta VA is how the vector changed, and just to remind you of all that Taylor series expansion again, path A to D approximated uh, so it can be compared with the path along B to C and the path along D to C all right, the path I should say along A to B this part here is being using the talus here has been approximated along here as though we're moving along here there we go. keep going and the change the net change in the vector by going along two different paths is this one negative this one plus this one here. All right. So we can collect that. Now, over a very, very small loop, this integration here is approximately just the area of the loop This and um, times this business here in the brackets. All right. So it's a very, very small, infinitesimally small loop, and these integrals work out to be approximately the area of the loop, delta A times delta B, so the distance in the A direction, the distance in the B direction, or distance in X1 direction times the distance in the X2 direction. All right, so the area of the loop times this little part in here. Now in flat space, all this would go to zero, because the, um, uh, these things would, would disappear. 
the basis vectors, no, they don't change from point to point in flat space, so all this would be zero. And the net change in the vector would be zero. Now what we're going to do is expand out the business in brackets. And when we do that here, here here's the expression again. Alright, so the pass sheet using the Leibniz rule or the product rule. So you differentiate this part times that plus the derivative of that part times that. Here we go, next line down. Alright, dx1s. Alright, and dx1s here. So the minus ones over here and the plus one from this term here over here. Alright, now dv mu dx2 can be replaced. If you remember back at the start of the video, we talked about ignition for parallel transport and the partial derivative of the vector components gave us expressions like this. And the same over here, partial derivative of the vector components with respect to x1 gives us this term here. Alright, next step down now is we'd like to factorize, so we have v uh, contravariant index nu and v contravariant index mu, we'd like to factorize out these vector components v mu. So this is v mu, this is v superscript mu, so we need to have, we need, they need to be the same indices. So what we can do is a little bit of swapping. If you look at the mu here and the mu there, the mu there, the mu there, these dummy indices can be interchanged and we're free to do that. So next line down, the mu, these two mu and these two mu will swap places. So mu mu, mu mu. Over here, the same over here, the mu is gone. These, these two new terms here have been interchanged with the new terms. Here we go. And now we have v mu, v mu, v mu, v mu. Over here. Get rid of the double minus there. That becomes plus. Alright. V mu here, v mu. Factorize it out and we get the area of the loop here times this business in square brackets we'll look at them in a moment and the common vector components v mu have been factorized out. Next step. The part in square brackets is related to the curvature of the manifold and is called the Riemann tensor. Here we go, Riemann tensor, like that. Now that previous calculation shows that the change in the vector delta VA is proportional to the area, that was that delta A times delta B business, so the closed loop, as well as the curvature of the manifold. Riemann tensor gives us the curvature of the manifold. Now we've worked with x1 and x2 directions, but if we generalize that to any manifold, then x1 is replaced with x beta, and x2 is replaced with x gamma, and we get the general form of the Riemann curvature tensor. And here it is, the general form of the Riemann curvature tensor. And this gives us the curvature of the manifold. Now in Euclidean space, this would all be zero, but zero curvature, but that's not the case with a curved manifold. 